Okay, all the kids come over here. Wait, 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 where are you going? Get over here. Come here. Listen, you only have one commandment. Obey your mom and dad. This is the commandment that lives with long life. Do you want to live a long time? Okay, the second one's almost like it. Listen to your, listen to your Shabbat school teacher. Okay, go ahead. Take off. <laughs> Okay, um, if you have your phones, you can actually use them right now because I, I got a couple of things I'm going to throw up. <sighs> wow, lots of people here. I see some strangers that come back to see me. <laughs> Not mentioning any names. <laughs> so Abba Father, just ask you, Lord, that your Ruach, your spirit, would just be poured out fresh and new upon this entire congregation, Father. I ask you, Lord, that your spirit would just... Anoint me fresh for this occasion, Father, and ask you, Lord, that you give every person here ears to hear and eyes to see. B'Shem, Yeshua, Mashiach. Amen. So everyone's out of here now? Okay, good. Um, real quick, um, if you're not following uh, on Telegram, Telegram really is the social media that is uncensored. Um, if I'm on Facebook, I mean Facebook, <laughs> literally, I, I'll have, you know, before they took my page off, literally, you know, 50,000 people, I would throw up a page and literally maybe four people, you know, and I'm being exaggerating, but literally hardly anyone would ever see it. Even when I throw up an article now, it's less than five people see an article. And even though I have 1,500 with a, a new page, whereas on Telegram, I have 1,600 people and 500 people see, the, see everything, everything seen. It's not censored. And with everything that's happening, look, more than news was really designed, um, just to kind of give you, it was really designed to equip watchmen to pray. And, you know, when we throw up an article, it's it, on the telegram, especially what's happening in Israel, if we're throwing up something very quick, I'm hoping that 300 people or 400 people are joining together at the same time and we're praying through events as they happen. You know, the idea is to activate prayer. There's a, there's a, there's a principle given in Leviticus Talking about five shall chase 100, but 10 shall put 10,000 to flight. You know, there's this exponentiality. And I think there's something that happens with prayer when we join together in, in, in one accord. Not only uh, the great thing about our Lord is that he's so big, he's in the midst of all of us. Despite the fact that we're thousands of miles apart, there could be literally, you know, 300 people all over the world. And the Lord is in the midst of all of us, you know, and, and just the exponentiality of, of prayer going on. So, um you know, we're living in a day and age where literally the very first words out of Yeshua's mouth was, take heed that no man deceive you, right? We have now have become a full-fledged news agency. We literally are not linking to anyone now. We literally now have journalists in Jerusalem, Budapest, Rome, and throughout the United States, and we're actually mass-producing content. And not only that, we're syndicating our content for free for churches all over and for congregations all over. And it's a very simple thing. It's a WordPress thing that we do. So now we're, we're syndicating, which is a huge, huge deal. If you don't get our worthy briefs, sign up for it. It's free. Now that is a little different than the worthy news because it is a daily devotion at the beginning of it. I like to encourage you. You know, news isn't doom and gloom. News actually should be activating us. It should be prophetically give us a sense of urgency about the days that we're in. Some people, they get so absorbed by the news that they are actually paralyzed by it. If that is your situation, you need to turn it off. Okay? What we should be is activated by the events that are taking place. Now, what's really cool is we developed an app, and we just updated the app. I finally got updated through Apple and through Google. And here's the cool thing about the app. On the app, let's say you click the Israel tab, not only do you get our news, but you can actually see what Times of Israel is saying right now, what Jerusalem Post is saying right now, what Arut Sheva is saying right now. I, for, if you click on U.S. news, you can actually see what Fox News is saying, what UPI, Reuters. Literally, it's set up so that on one app, you can literally follow 50 news, source, north, news sources very quickly. What? Uh, I, I, well, you know, Google is bad, so yeah. Now, here's a cool thing. We just started this fund the beginning of, or the last week of October. We've already sent $15,000 over to Israel. 100% of everything we're raising for Israel is actually going to Israel. 
It's going to believers in the land. We're, nothing is, you know, nothing is part of what we do. I mean, everything is just going straight. And so I've been really encouraged that while we've been, quote, unquote, redeployed in America, we're, we're still sowing into Israel. So now we're talking about the Simchat Torah War. Now, the significance of this war, I believe, we'll see in the coming years. And I'll really get into it. But the one thing I want you to understand is that right now, we're really in the middle of a test. And most people just don't understand that they're in a test. You know, if you don't realize that you're in a test, of course you're bombing the test, right? And, and look, if the Lord tested Yeshua, you know, he was tested for 40 days in the world. If he tested Yeshua, do you not realize that you're in a test? And what tends to happen is people forget that God tests us, and he tests us each and every day. And right now, the, the test that's really been given to the world, what I believe is what I call the Israel test. I really believe that God is getting ready to do something special, getting ready to do something, but he's trying to figure out who can God release this anointing through. And God is using Israel to be a test question. Now, what I love about this particular verse, it says, he says, but his whole hates the wicked and the one who loves violence, this word violence is Hamas. It literally is the word Hamas. And so God is actually using the Hamas question. And it's amazing to me. It's almost, it's, it's almost surreal to me. Anyone defending what Hamas did or tried to, to, to almost distance themselves of the horrific massacre and the horrific nature of, of what took place. The, the, it was so graphic and so gruesome that you had congressmen watching videos walking out. They couldn't watch it. And it's so horrific they, they couldn't even release the, the release to the public how graphic it was. I mean, think about that. That that that's like the atrocity of. And so we've never had a situation like this, you know, in modern history, you know, except going back to the Holocaust. But the timing of this, I really believe, is going to play out and be very significant. Now, what I. What I want you to understand, and first off, is why should we pray for Israel to eliminate Hamas? One and foremost reason, and very simple, there are two, over two million Palestinians living in Gaza that have no access to the gospel. No access. So if you say to Israel, stop, you know, put a ceasefire, do not let them finish, what you're saying is we want to go ahead and send two million people to hell without even an opportunity to receive the gospel. There's one, one church in all of Gaza. Now, here's why. I'm gonna, I, I pulled up this particular article from Wikipedia to show you you should never use Wikipedia as a source. Because here it is, the very first line, it literally says, the Gaza Baptist Church was a Baptist church in Gaza City in the state of Palestine. What? There's no Palestinian state. That's why you should never use Wikipedia as a source. But, but here's the point, right? In this particular, in this particular thing, what gives you an understanding, there's only three churches in all of Gaza, one evangelical church, and the reason why the, the Gaza Baptist Church is allowed to exist, it's really steeped up in replacement theology and really has a hatred for Jewish people. And what it literally has caused is a situation where Ma'am, we saw each other last night. And you asked me, am I saved? I guess so. I guess so. Anyway. So it's a kind of a funny story. I walked into a hotel room last night at 11.45 in the morning, 11.45 at night, trying to get in. And she had run into her right at the, at the, at the checkout counter. Anyway, so here we are. There's three churches in all of Gaza. This one evangelical church actually is so steep in a replacement theology, it fits their narrative. What people don't understand, when, when Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, it wasn't but a few years later that the, the Gaza Baptist Society, the Bible Society in Gaza, was basically the, the manager was killed and the, it was forced to shut down. They have no access to the gospel. I mean, do you think that the UN is going to remove Hamas? Do you think the United States? No, the only people that are going to remove Hamas is Israel. 
And what I believe, if we actually understand what God is doing, I believe that God wants to finish the salvation, right? It says the fullness of the Gentiles must come in. And it says from every nation, tribe, and tongue. I, I think there's a couple tribes inside of Gaza that God is trying to redeem. We just posted up a story not even two weeks ago that there was 200 Muslims inside of Gaza that had dreams of Yeshua. I mean, we're talking about a move of God happening right now. I think that there's something supernatural happening within the Muslim community. And it's happening in the midst of what we call catastrophes. We had a situation, um, I didn't post this up. Hey, can I go a little long today so I can throw in some personal stories? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Is that I, I, I'm just gonna throw you a story, a couple stories. In the dual earthquakes that happened in Turkey, there were multiple, multiple stories of kids that were trapped under the rubble, that were under the rubble for like 15 days, that, that, that should have died. And literally, they were talked about how a man in white came and fed them and gave them water. And, and they were having this, and, and they were totally fine. They weren't stressed. They weren't, this man in white. And there was multiple stories. I, God is moving. So that's one reason why, right? The second thing is, stop reading the mainstream news. I don't read it at all. New York Times goes ahead and literally starts riots. Okay? The New York Times and the mainstream media said that, that Israel bombed a hospital. 500 people died. And what happened literally was that rockets flew out from the Islamic Jihad and it was a failed rocket that landed on a hospital parking lot. Now, within minutes of that, I posted up one telegram, the actual footage from Al Jazeera. Because I saw on Twitter, someone said that Al Jazeera, so I jumped onto YouTube, I jumped onto the live stream, and I went back. And I was able to cut and clip and post right. They actually filmed a failed rocket landing at the exact same time. But this, this mainstream media goes ahead and listens to Hamas as though they give or the truth. The reality is there's no freedom of press inside of Gaza. You can't trust, you can't even trust the figures of death coming out of Gaza. Because we don't know. The reality is that Israel is doing all that it can to prevent a genocide because they're dropping leaflets by the millions. They're talk, calling and texting people when they need to leave. They're, 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 they're sending in what, what we call a, it's, it's kind of like a dummy rocket. When they're getting ready to hit a building and they need to make sure that no one's in that building, they'll go ahead and throw like a dummy thing to hit that building to scare everyone out of the rocket before they actually take it out. So what we have right now is a media that is complicit that literally is the mouthpiece of the enemy. And what I mean by the enemy, the, the, we're fighting really principalities and powers. Right. Literally, they're, they're a mouthpiece of the father of lies. Sure. And they're literally starting riots. Because when they said they bombed this hospital, there were riots outside the U.S. Embassy and outside the Israeli Embassy in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon. There was, it almost started a war over what took place. Stop reading all the junk. Okay. The main thing I think is going to come out of this war is the final drive of the Jewish people coming home. What we're seeing now is the levels of anti-Semitism that we've never seen. And we have this passage in Jeremiah that says, and I will first, what, send forth fishermen and I will draw Israel home. And then it says, look, I'm going to have to send forth hunters. I'm going to have to shove them back home. It literally is coming to a place now. I think the rise of anti-Semitism is actually bringing this. So we're at this question, of the Israel question. Listen, God will preserve Israel with or without you. He actually doesn't need us any way, shape, or form. But what he does say is the same question that Esther was given. And Esther was given this question when Mordecai faced with the accidental threat of Hamas wiping out the Jewish people, and he says to Esther, if you do not rise up, don't worry, relief and deliverance will come from another place. 
But who knows whether you've been brought to the kingdom for such times as this, that you've been brought to this kingdom for such a time as this, as this test question, will we stand with the Jewish people? Now, if we stand with the Jewish people, though, it does not mean that we're anti-anyone. Because what we have to understand is God's got a plan to redeem people from all nations, tribes, and tribes, including the sons of Ishmael. And what you have to understand is that God's plan of redeeming the sons of Ishmael is also part of the equation for us as a test question. Because if we allow that hatred to come in, then we're complicit in, in not allowing the redemption plan to take place. What we're facing are principalities and powers that are trying to blind the sons of Ishmael to the truth that Yeshua died for them too. That's the reality that we're facing. So now, I believe Israel is coming to this place where it's finding out who its true friends are. But now, ready? It's not finding out who's, not only who its true friends are, but who its family is. Because right now, Israel is looking around and they're saying, who is standing with us? Who's really standing with us? And they know that the, gra the greatest friends they have are believers. Because we're standing. We're born for such a time as this. We're born in a time of adversity. So now let's get into where I think we are. We're now at what I call um, the harvest of the world. And I've mentioned this many times, but I just, I, you just got to understand this concept. If, if there's any concept, you got to understand it's this concept here. The harvest of the world. You know, in this passage in Amos, it says, what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring back the waste cities I'm going to rebuild them, and I'm never going to what uproot them out of the land. For anyone that thinks that Israel is not, is not going to survive, it's going to thrive. Amen. Okay? So, but I want to kind of show you where this is coming from. The beginning of this passage, really, in 11 and 12, actually goes back to the Acts. And so here was this big discussion amongst Jewish believers. Because in the first century, the question to Jewish believers is, what do we do with all these Gentiles that are saved? The irony is at the end of the age, we got a bunch of Gentiles saying, what do we do with these Jews that believe? It's the opposite question. But in the first century, they were quoting, and he was quoting this passage in Amos. And he says, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. I'm going to restore as in the days of old. That the, the sons of Israel, or the, the, all the Gentiles are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Now, the end of this passage is a passage in 14 and 15 I just read. But in the first century... When James or Yaakov reads this passage, he doesn't read 14 and 15. Why? Because in the first century, it did not apply to them. In the first century, the Jewish people were already in the land. The diaspora doesn't take place till 78, 70 AD, when the temple is destroyed, when the Jewish people are scattered. In the first century, this didn't seem to apply. They didn't understand. And so now we understand in our generation the completeness of this passage that this was a sign of the end of the age. And the whole passage, really, the focal point, if you understand the focal point, is verse 13. And verse 13 talks about a harvest of harvests, that the plowman should overtake the reaper and the treasure of grapes from him that sows the seed. And, and what it is is, is biblical po poetic language talking about a harvest. Now, what you have to understand is that we're literally in the harvest of the world. If you, if you get any question out of this, is that, that the harvest that we're living in, this remnant of our harvest, will actually quit, will be greater than the remnant of all the generations before us combined. See, we're, we're alive for the harvest. It's, it's, it's not more than a remnant that gets saved, but the remnant that we live in now is so great. Look, do you want a piece of pizza out of an eight-inch pie, or do you want a piece of pizza out of an eight-foot pie? I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's still the same percentage. It's still the same remnant. It just so happens to be so much bigger. So now I'm going to get into this. So now we're talking about the birthing of a kingdom. And no woman ever loves to give birth. I never met a woman that said, oh, I love giving birth. <laughs> and most women, right, when they give birth, what is God dinging? I got I to gotta find it. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay, so this woman that gives birth, here it is, there's coming a point now, and what I want to focus on is a water-breaking moment. 
See, we're, we're, we're focused on the, this birth of a kingdom, but we're not talking about what happens. Now, when the water breaking moment takes place, it doesn't mean that the birth plane stopped. It has nothing, it, it, it only intensified, but there's something else happening. And I, I think that people don't understand this. When at beginning of the age, when Peter's preaching, and all these Jews come to faith, there's 3,000 Jews that come to faith, they ask him, what is happening now? And he quotes this passage in Amos, uh, in, um, in Joel rather, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall have dreams and visions. And when he quotes this passage, it actually goes, and it actually begins in verse 23. And this is what I want you to focus on. O children of Zion, for the Lord your God has given you the early rain and the latter rain, the early rain, the mare, the latter rain, the malkosh. See, I believe that God is getting ready to indicate what is getting ready to take place, that what happened at the beginning of the age is getting ready to happen at the end of the age. And what I believe is getting ready to take place is another outpouring of the Spirit that we're having this water-breaking moment. Why? To usher in the harvest of the world. Amen. See, if, we, if our mindset is on the wrong thing, we'll miss the opportunity we're actually part of. So I want to jump to this, the Simcock Torah War. I gave you that intro, and I've given that intro, I've talked about that a lot, because it really is my heart of, of the generate. But now we're at the Simcock Torah War. Now, what took place prophetically? Now, it happened on the Simchat Torah, on the day of Simchat Torah, is the eighth day. There's a hidden mystery in the number eight. It means new beginnings. It means resurrection. It means new life. Amen. What most people do not realize is when the church gathered together on what they called the first day of the week, they didn't look at it as the first day of the week. They literally called it the eighth day or the Lord's day. Because every day they assembled on that first day was because they were always looking toward the eighth day. You said, well, there's not eight days in a week. Exactly. What they were anticipating was a time outside of time. They were looking toward the eighth millennium. They were looking to the, the time outside of time. They were looking outside. On the eighth day was also connected to what we call this Feast of Bikurim, or the Feast of First Fruits, or the Feast of Resurrection. So when the Lord rose again from the dead, they looked at it. That happened on the eighth day. And so while they gathered together on Shabbat, they continued that gathering celebration of Shabbat, and they went into Saturday night, into Shabbat night. You say, well, how do you know Shabbat night? Well, it's really a Havdalah service. How do I know? Because Acts tells us that Paul was preaching, and he was preaching so late into the night that someone fell asleep and fell out of the balconies, <laughs> and he died. Did that happen on Saturday or Sunday night? If it was Sunday night, guess what? It wouldn't be the first day. It would be the beginning of the second day because the evening and the morning. So that's how I know it was on Saturday night. They were having a hot dollar service. And a lot of the services happened on Sunday morning before they went to service. And that's how the early, that's how the, the beginning of, the, of the, the Messianic movement happened. So now the Simchat Torah War happened specifically on a time, specifically, now the other thing is it happened on the 50th year of what? The War of Yom Kippur. 50, connected to Jubilee, connected to New Beginnings, connected. So God, by allowing this to take place, is actually signifying something to us. Now, I know a lot of people are caught up in, Israel allowed it to happen, listen, don't get caught. God allows and doesn't allow. And what we find out later, and I think we'll find this out in the future, is the fact that Hamas, who is Sunni, did not tell the Shiites what they were doing. Why? Because they wanted credit. The events that took place in the Simchat Torah War could have been 100 times worse. Because I believe what we'll find out in, in the future is the fact that Hamas and Hezbollah were supposed to coordinate an attack against Israel simultaneously. And the events that we saw in Gaza would have been very, would have been, been un, un, uncomparable to what happened in the north. 
that you could have had a 10,000. Because there's a friction between Sunni and Shiite, and they wanted credit, they went ahead and jumped the gun. And because of that, Israel was allowed to call up 300,000 reserves, and we didn't have a catastrophe like they were planning. I know how horrific that day was, but I believe there was a lot of grace that we do not even begin to understand. There are things that are happening. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. So I want to go back to 1967 because this is going to, this is going to, uh, this is going to kind of tie in a lot of things. Now, who was born in 1967? Before 1967? Just trying to see here. Okay, I just want to see who was older than I am. That's all. <laughs> now, who was saved during the Jesus movement? Okay, 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 okay. just got that. Okay, so I want to talk about a time. 1966, we had what? God is Dead, Time Magazine. Then we had the Jesus Movement. This magazine cover comes out in, I think, 1972. The Jesus Movement was birthed in 1967. Um, a very close friend of mine, John Higgins, who was the right-hand man of um, Chuck Smith, he runs a Calvary Chapel in Tempe, Arizona. He was the one that actually started what we call the House of Miracles that was seen in the Jesus Revolution movie. He was actually the first one to manage what they call the House of Miracles, these halfway houses they made for hippies. He said that there was a shift they could feel when Israel retook Jerusalem, and there was a shift in the atmosphere. Now, in talking to him about that revival, what most people don't realize, see, what tends to happen in revivals is that we sanitize revivals. We don't actually understand what was taking place in that time. He was telling me there were so many crazy cults, cults that we never even can imagine. There was literally a cult called the Children of God. And the Children of God was ran by a guy named um, Moshe David or uh, Moses D David. And this guy literally would send his uh, young uh, girl uh, disciples to go out to uh, flirting, flirting fishing and literally would prostitute themselves to get disciples. They were literally kind of these crazy kind of drug cults at the same time. And so that what you had was a real revival in the midst of all this crazy other apostate stuff. That's what we're getting ready to see again. We're getting ready to go into a situation where you're going to have the true move of God, and inside the true move of God, you're going to have all this really weird and you think it was weird in 1967. Yeah. We're getting ready to go into bizarreness. But, but I, I want to go into something, and this is, this is really specific. I believe that the Jesus revolution, that move of God is actually indicating something for us. Now, I want to show you this passage. This is a passage talking about the Lord right before his return, talking about Elijah coming. But here's the thing, it says this, it says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers. They were living in a fatherless generation. Ready for this? In 1967, there was very few church fathers that tended to the needs of a generation that was so lost. So lost and so whatever. But ready? In that generation, these young men and young women were having dreams and visions of Yeshua. I believe that God did that Jesus revolution, that movement of God of young people. Guess what? I'm not saying you're old, Ned, but you, you're getting there. <laughs> this generation that got saved back then now is the grandfathers now. Where back then there was just a few fathers that could usher in a generation. Now you have a, a massive generation. This young generation that had dreams and visions when you're young men. I'm not saying you're old, Ned. <laughs> but dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. That now God has actually set up a generation to usher in a harvest of harvests. That he's literally what we saw as a prequel of 1967. I believe what's going to happen in our generation will we'll surpass that by numbers that we can't even begin to imagine. And I 
believe the timing of the war is giving an indication to us about something taking place. So, I'm not sure if I should. Did I ever show you this, this photo? All right. So, here was a very interesting tease. I, I really believe, and I, you know, obviously I, I can't take this on any kind of spirit. I think an angel went to an editor and said, hey, this is the headline. It's going to be an eye-grabbing headline, but it's actually a picture for us. Here it is. It says, they're working on 2,000-year-old pilgrimage road, prepare for modern revival. I believe that they don't even realize how big the revival is coming. And what it's talking about is the step road, the step road that connects the Pulisilom that goes up to the Temple Mount. And we just discovered the step road around 2014. I was actually privileged to go on the road before anyone else was able to go. I know a lot of people that do a lot of the digs, and this dig that they were doing was outside of what we call the Dung Gate. It's outside, you can, if you are standing in the, if you're standing at, at the area that I'm talking about, it's on the opposite side of the city of David, you can actually see the three arches that the Jewish people would have walked up to go into the temple. And this step road was a road, when I walked on it, I said, this is the road for sure that Yeshua walked on. How do I know? Because I'll, I'll explain to you in a second. See, we're also excavating out the biblical pool of Siloam. Now, the pool of Siloam is where everyone was mikvahed. You were mikvahed in the pool of Siloam. Why? Because you could not go into the temple unless you were purified. You couldn't just wake up in the morning and just go into the temple. You had to go and be mikvahed. And guess what? Everyone was mikvahed at the Pool of Siloam, and they walked up the step road. And I know the Lord was in the temple. I know that because the word tells me. So guess what else happened? He got mikvahed. Guess what else happened? He walked on this road that I just walked on. So I, I already knew in 2014 how significant this was. But now, this Pool of Siloam is going to be very big. When I first went to Israel, um, I was there with a tour guide. And the tour guide says, this little creek bed... This is the Pool of Siloam. And I looked at him and said, that has no way the Pool of Siloam. He said, no, no. So I said, listen, I read the, the book, the, the Life and Times of, of Yeshua by Alfred Edersheim. And Alfred Edersheim's book is about like three inches thick. And he goes through about the Pool of Siloam in great detail. The Pool of Siloam, okay, this is where we're excavating now. And now we're, now we're about eight feet down. But that's how big it was. It was literally an acre and a quarter in size. An acre and a quarter in size. So I, 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 I'm going to tell you something from my heart. I can't find any biblical evidence for this. I can't find any. But if you understand how things work cyclically, how it begins is how it ends, how, how things kind of, God, God closes out loops. At the beginning of the age, when Peter's preaching and gives that word in Joel 2, and 3,000 Jews come to faith, do you think they were baptized in one at a time? I, I just don't think that. I, I think that what wind up happening is like that, that yellow house right down there, that's where the pool's from. Let's just walk down there, let's get baptized. I think that there was a big march and all these Jews came to the Pool of Siloam. This is where they get mikvahed all the time. It would be no other thing but another mikvah. And I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So ready? If this is where the 3,000 came to faith, and, you know, my word tells me that all of Israel shall be saved, Kai would make sense. You would need a baptismal pool big enough. Oh my goodness. Are we digging out this pool? I think there's something significant there. I think that the, this is an indication to us about something. I think it's an indication that God is getting ready to usher in the Jewish people. Now, let's get to the passage. In the, in the pool saloon, I'm using this Talmudic passage because it literally talks about the, 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 the festival of water drawing, 
which most people don't understand. It was this great festival every day on the eighth day. Is that your phone? I knew it. Give me it. <laughs> anyway, anyway. All right. Okay. So anyway, on the eighth day, right, on the pool of water drawing, there are only three festivals where every Jewish male had to go to Jerusalem. One was Pesach, or Passover. One was Shavuot, or, or Pentecost. And the third was Sukkot, or Tabernacles. So on these particular three days, there were thousands upon thousands. You know, as many, at least 50,000, if not more than 100 to 150,000. We don't know what the exact number was, but guess what? Jerusalem was filled with Jewish people. And this particular day begins on the seventh day and concludes into, the, into Saturday evening, going into the eighth day. Go, get, it, it, this is kind of like, and it got all, it's kind of like, if you can imagine the Macy's Day Parade that we have on Thanksgiving, this is the Jerusalem Macy's Day Parade. So here it is, there's a water drawing. Every Jew is getting mikvah. Every Jew now is, they're blowing shofars, they're, they're hitting tambourines, they're dancing, they're going up the steps, you know. That's kind of the, the, the thing that's happening. And when it happens that the, the high priest is taking the picture, he's quoting this passage in Isaiah. Behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. With joy you shall draw waters out of the wells of Yeshua. Now the whole water drawing is going up and they're watching up. And then they quote a passage in Psalm 118. 118, now the word save now is the word Hoshiana or Hosanna in English. Hoshiana. I beseech you, Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity, or, or another way of translating is grant me success. Now, this is right before another verse. Buruka Baba Shema Adonai. If you kind of study out Matthew, you'll realize that Matthew is laid out going back to the Psalm 118. It's laying out different passages, and it's almost in correlation. But here we are, and they're saying, verse 25, you got to remember, the whole Temple Mount, this is the, this is the last verse that is read, when now you got thousands of people on the Temple Mount. Everyone's been celebrating. Everyone's gone up, and now we're getting ready to go into, it's now the evening. This is the thing, and now everyone pauses to contemplate what has just took place. On the Temple Mount, in this great pause, we read a passage in John. Whoops. Oh, I should go. Uh, uh, I'm going to go back and then go back. What do we read? That Yeshua cries out. If anyone believes in me, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and whoever believes in me, out of scripture shall flow rivers of living water. The entire temple mount is completely silent. It's during this pause that he screams this out. He actually says, I am the fulfillment of Isaiah. I am the fulfillment of this passage you just read. Now, I want to, I want to go back to a few verses because I just realized something. So this passage, when, when we talk about the Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, What's interesting is, on the first day of the war that they went in, they were literally chanting Psalm 1825. They were literally praying, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, save us, grant us success. The one verse away, one verse away from the kingdom. <laughs> Think about that. We're one verse away. I mean, I just, I just thought that was cool anyway. You kind of have to understand how I think. I'm excited about these things. So when, when Yeshua goes ahead and gives this, you know, when he screams out, if anyone believes in me, out of his belly, that's when there's a discussion. Who is this guy? And the, the, the main question of all the questions is, who is Yeshua? you got to get that question down. That's a question. If you don't have that question down, don't even worry about the other test questions because you, you bomb the only real question you need to figure out. But once you figure out this question, then the question is you have to find out the other questions that are being tested with us. So now there's a division among them. Now, now what's interesting is that particular night, going into after he screams this out, 
We're going into the nighttime. These giant candelabras are being erected all over Jerusalem. The entire city, it says in the Talmud, is lit up, and there's not even a dark place. It literally was the city lit up. And it's that next day that you have the woman called in. Oops. Oh, um, the, the next morning they would have quoted this passage. It's actually a prayer. Be thou praised, O Lord God, King of the universe, who makes light and causes darkness, who makes peace and creates all the light of the world as the treasure of life. This is a, a prayer that is read. And the next morning you find Yeshua, and there's a woman that's called an adultery. So they're testing Yeshua. He is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. They all leave. He's using the illustration of what took place the night before. All Jerusalem was lit up, and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So this is what he quotes. What I find interesting about this is the only place the pool of Siloam is used is in chapter 9, continuing on. In chapter 9, it literally says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the night is coming that no man can work. For as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. This is before the, the, the blind man goes down and is healed. And there's the whole discussion. You read chapter 9 in close detail. But this is the only place in all the Gospels where he gives us a warning saying there's coming a time that no man can work. And it's connected to a pool that we're excavating, meaning that we're closing out the age. We're closing out the age. I believe that we're seeing now the preparation for the salvation and the baptism of Israel. I see that we're, we're setting up the stage now for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. I see the stage being set up that God has now set up a, a whole generation of fathers to raise up a generation of fatherless. I see, a gener I see we're coming now to this point in history and I know that a lot of people want to focus on who's the Antichrist. Don't worry about who the Antichrist is. If you know who Jesus is, you don't have to really worry about who the Antichrist is. Okay? And a lot of people are really focused on about seven years of tribulation. And really focused on is the tribulation start. I I'm going to just share with you something from my heart. I believe whatever God does is so much greater than whatever the enemy does. And I believe there's something given to us that is a, a, a hidden mystery. And I, I'll find out if I'm right. If I'm wrong, it's okay. I'm, I'm allowed to be wrong. I'm human. But cycles of seven, Shemitah cycles of seven, are very predominant in Scripture. The Jewish people, they don't understand that we believe that the Messiah, the son of David, right, Mashiach, the, 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 um, Yeshua HaMashiach is our Messiah, the son of David, came first as the Mashiach ben David, or the Mashiach ben Yosef, they came to fulfill prophecies talking about a suffering Messiah. And then it's coming again to fulfill prophecies of the king of Messiah, Mashiach ben David. Now, Orthodox Jews, they see the conflict in Scripture. They see there's conflict, there's a, a suffering Messiah, which they call Mashiach ben Yosef, and a, and, a, and a kingly Messiah, Mashiach ben David. And they see this conflict, so they said, there must be two messiahs coming. They don't see it as one messiah coming two different times. They see it as two different messiahs coming. I'm pointing this out because there's something very unique in the story of Joseph. In the story of Joseph, Joseph is cast off by his brothers, just like Yeshua has been cast off. Even when his brothers go looking at him, they, they see him face to face. They can't recognize him because it's got all this Egyptian garb. It's kind of like how Yeshua is dressed up now and, you know, his name is Jesus and he celebrated Christmas and Easter, even though he never did any of those things, right? But he is, he's dressed up now in Egyptian garb and they can't really see the Mashiach son of David that we see. And so now, ready? When they go seek him, Right? When they go find him, he reveals himself, and then they mourn. They're weeping. That's what we believe is Zechariah 12.10, when they shall look upon me whom they pierced. But now, ready? If that's the scenario playing out, 
And we're, we're playing that scenario out in Joseph again. Joseph, before his brothers came seeking for bread, there were seven years of plenty. There was a, a harvest, so to speak. A harvest in ready Egypt. A harvest in Gentile land. The harvest of the Gentiles. Seven years. I think, I think that this, this, this time in the war that starts out, starts out literally at a, at a, right at the new year. You know, Rosh Hashanah just happened, or, or uh, Yom um, Truah just happens just a, a, a few days prior. Simchat Wart happens. Could this be a seven-year cycle? 2023 to 2030 of a harvest of harvests. See, if, if we get so focused on seven years of trib and seven years of tribulation, we could actually be missing out on the opportunity that we're actually part of that God is actually doing right now. If our focus is on the wrong things, we're going to miss what God is actually doing. Look, you can't, there's nothing you can do to stop a new world order coming. There's nothing you can do to, uh, you can go ahead and get so caught up in that. It's a distraction. So much of a distraction that the things you actually can take care of, the things that you can actually do as praying, as sharing, as just being who you're called to be, because we're called to make disciples of men. If we understand that, and we understand that season that we're in, I think we could be walking into what I call the greatest move of God in the history of all mankind. And I believe the church is missing out on what God is actually doing. There was a story we just did about two weeks ago. 600,000 Nicaraguans attended these huge revivals and tens of thousands of people got saved and baptized and came into the kingdom. Amen. There are moves of God happening. Let's understand where we are prophetically. Now, I believe that we don't have a whole lot of time left. I believe that when the Lord goes ahead and gives us his understandings of the pool saloon, gives us understandings of these different things, he's telling us that the window's closing. But it's not time to bunker up. It's not time to hide. It's actually time to be more bold, to be more vocal, because we now have all the proof Lord talk is actually happening. So we would expect, we would expect, ready? At the beginning of the age, they tried to silence Peter and John. They tried to silence the apostles. They threatened them with death. They threatened them with every kind of whatever. I think we're getting ready to walk into this age of persecution again. I think we're getting ready to walk into this time again. But it's not time to cower. It's time to be more vocal. And guess what's going to happen? A move is going to take place. Amen. I'm, I'm going a little over. Okay, I'm going to give one last story. One last story, because this is really good. 1949, communist revolution takes place in China. They said, God will be dead. By 1953, there was not a single missionary left in China. There was no, no Western influence to reach them with the gospel. There was no one to touch them. There wasn't even 50,000 believers in China. Persecution came. It came like a fire. We're going to exterminate Christianity. We're going to go ahead and eliminate it off the face of the planet. We will never have to deal with this again. We'll have a society where Christians aren't involved. And guess what? We'll have the perfect communist society. Now there's 100 million Chinese believers. 100 million. I, that's what's coming. It's going to come with the intensity of persecution. But guess what? He's given us the spirit and the, and the boldness to go ahead and persevere through all this. 
The more they try to silence us, the more the Spirit of God will give us a voice. The more the, the Spirit of God will give us a trumpet out of our voice to shout the cries, the Lord is coming. We're almost home. Now, I want to focus on something. It says, behold, I'm making all things new. We're talking about a new beginning, a new Simchat Torah. And then at the same time, we're talking about how the Lord said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. It is done. In God's mind, prophecy is already done. We're now in the middle of living this out. But then he says something very interesting here. To the thirsty. See, I believe there's a whole body of Messiah that's very, very content. I had my cup of water. I'm good with that. You're not getting any more. If you're content with a cup of water, that's all you're going to get. You're not going to get any more. But if you come to this place, Lord, I need more. I need more. I need more. Lord, don't just turn on the spigot. Turn on the spigot and drown me. That's where we should be. If we're at that place, then guess what's going to happen? It says this, arise and shine for your light has come. For darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness of people. That's what we see in the world. But guess what? The nation shall come to your light. And the people in the glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come. Now notice this. What I love about this in verse 18 is the fulfillment that Hamas will no longer be heard in the streets of Israel again. Because that word Vaz is Hamas. Hamas shall no longer be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. But you shall call your walls Yeshua. <laughs> He is our defense in these last days. That's the only defense you need. You need to go ahead and go forward in boldness, intensity, and purpose. Proclaiming the king is coming soon. And in order to do so, you're going to have to say, Lord, I need more. I, I want an anointing. I want, I want an outpouring of the Spirit so much so, Father, that we go ahead and go forward in power and anointing and so much so that, right, guess what? Walls are taken. So, Abba, Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would seal this word. Father, I just praise you, Abba, and I thank you. And Father, give this congregation just a fresh touch of your spirit. May an anointing go forward, Father. And Father, may you raise up a generation, Father, to usher in a generation of generations, Father. We thank you, Abba, that you brought us here for the harvest. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen.